Hello, hello, hello. Good to see everybody. Mm. Take a moment as usual to look around. Welcome with your eyes, everybody who's here. Mm. Glad to see folks. Um, as you may or may not know, Michelle and Stephen are um, about to start teaching a retreat today uh, up in British Columbia with Pari. So they won't be joining us. Um, actually, there's been kind of um, sort of some severe weather up there. And so there've, a bunch of people are at the retreat center tonight. Um, but not Stephen and Michelle. <laughs> Pari's up there. Um, and I think we'll kind of get the retreat started without them because they their flight got canceled because of wind. Um, so they'll plan on heading up tomorrow just to be safe. Um, but they send their regards, they send their love and hope everyone's doing well. Hopefully they get a, an evening of rest a little bit unplanned for. So um, we'll just do the same format as usual, I'll offer some instructions of a short talk and then um, some time for questions. I do, the instructions may be a little longer this time. Um, so bear with me or uh, turn off your sound if you get tired of listening to me. Mm. So coming into your seated posture. Letting your eyes come to close. Starting to orient toward more of this receptive quality of the attention. With whatever sense experiences are predominant right now. In the body, the other senses, the mind activity. Even seeing how this simple shift of shutting the eyes and coming to listen and receive transform so much of our relationship with what's happening. And as you start to feel any sense of connectedness, presence, in this receiving, rather than anchoring in one particular quality of direct sense experience. I just want to invite you to see if you can get a sense of just the space around you. And really, for this moment, just directly around you. Like if we imagine a a small circle 
just around the boundaries of the body. and just below us and just above us. Where we might attune to some sense of space around us. Sometimes it might feel more like this, a tuning, like a a direct sense of the space just around the body. Sometimes it might feel like a construction, kind of an imaginary sense of space just around us. that we are conjuring. It doesn't matter. Seeing what it's like to attune to this limited sense of space. Of course, there are still physical sensations. There's still other sensory experiences in mind. I'm not trying to reject them. Perhaps seeing how they might change in their impact when our primary focus of attention is really just on the sense of space around us. Sometimes it might feel like a tight squeeze. And so we can kind of open up that sense of space to whatever room we're in. And maybe we have a sense of the limits of the space, the boundaries and the walls and the ceiling, the floor. even if we're not directly seeing them or feeling them with the body. There is some sense of the space of this room. defined by the walls, ceiling, floor. We can attune the attention to this sense of space. And of course, the body again is still happening. Senses still arise and pass. Maybe there's some sense of them doing so in this bigger field of space. Of course, there are other objects in the room, perhaps other beings. Not denying trying to make them vanish. But we are attuning to the non-material. 
aspect of the room of this delineated space. Don't worry if it feels more of an attuning or more of a construction. Just notice. And maybe if you like, we can do just one more expansion beyond that into the building that we are in a house, an apartment, a bigger complex. A sense of a, a bigger space around us, around this room. It's still limited, still delineated, boundaried. More things, more beings. but also simply this quality of the absence of materiality within the boundaries. So we may find one of these sizes is easier to conceive of, to attune to, to abide in. So coming back into the smallest version of just the space around the body. Be not too cramped. but not so far beyond the boundaries of the skin. A sense of this limited space. And seeing to what degree we might be able to bring the flavor of loving kindness to this space. Filling this space evenly. to the borders of this boundary with tenderness. Soft heartedness. Friendliness. Needn't be intense or overwhelmingly powerful. Just noticing if there is even this quality of gentleness that the heart can offer. Toward this small space in which we're sitting. And then is there any way that the body can receive the sense of tenderness as it's abiding in the space. That 
This kindness is not limited to the immaterial, but pervades the space and everything in it. So just seeing for a moment to what degree this might be available to offer this tenderness, to receive this tenderness in the space. If you like opening again to the sense of the space in the room we're seated in. The space boundaried by these walls, ceiling, floor, windows, doors. And with this attunement to the sense of space, do we feel any ability to fill it with tender heartedness? Not discriminating or even discerning all the variety of forms in the space. And trusting. This quality of loving kindness. Can fill into all of the corners, nooks and crannies. We offer to everything in this room, in this space. With this body and this mind, this heart not excluded. So we can attune to quality of caring that fills the space. And it's also received in our bodies, in our hearts and minds as phenomena in this space. offered and received, given but not lost, gained and given, gained again. Maybe taking the time to expand again to the house or building that you're in. And seeing to what degree the mind feels capable of filling that space with care, tenderness. Warm heartedness. To what degree we still feel included in that field of metta. And taking time to explore if one of these spaces feels more easily accessible, letting yourself just practice in one size. 
if you want to explore greater delineated spaces, wider, bigger, or more narrow, smaller, giving yourself the permission to explore. But simply attuning to some sense of space and finding our way to care, to fill that space with care and to find our sense of inclusion in that field of tenderness.
So I'll say a little more about this approach to the loving kindness practice in a, in a moment. Um, but yeah, I just want to say just how amazing it is. You know, there's a, quite a few, I don't know, maybe five folks or so here who I got to see in person about a week ago, just over a week ago. And uh, uh, what a, amazing. <laughs> and how funny to be back on Zoom after that. Uh, we had an outdoor day-long retreat uh, in Western Massachusetts when I was visiting family out there. And um, mm, just... Um, amazing uh you know to see what it's like again to to do that and um also just an, such an appreciation for how this technology you know has allowed us to continue over it's coming on two years now and um yeah the sense of kind of connection and continuity still being so so profound and powerful and, and really supportive and um and how nice it was also to share safe space with folks um, out there. And nice also for me too, just, you know, when I'm out back in Massachusetts where I'm from, it's often very busy. Um, you know, I'm just visiting a lot of people, family, friends, um, and just, uh, I think the the part of what I wanted to speak on was just that that sense of of not feeling like a lot of space um, uh, for a lot of my time, you know, and and it has to do with everything, right? It has to do with just getting on an airplane and there's like it's cramped and there's a lot of people and you're wearing your masks and um, just the sense of kind of compactedness and um, lack of space uh, that I, I sort of really experience in that um, part of the journeying, you know, and then, uh, you know, where I was staying, just not a lot of physical space, not a lot of privacy, um, always sort of people around, and um, and then not a lot of space in terms of my agenda, you know, like every day was just very busy uh, with a lot of responsibilities and um, engagements and plans and so just how nice it's actually been to come home. And um, it just feels like there's a lot more space these days. I still have things I've had to attend to and it's been, you know, busy in some ways, but but a little less um, pressing. I went out paddling this morning in the ocean and just like that sense of a space around me in the ocean. And uh, it felt like such a relief, you know, and it was something I thought about quite a bit up in, in Massachusetts. Uh, times I've found that, you know, out there, the sense of space externally. I mean, there's a place, um, a little retreat center in Sunderland, I believe, called the Temenos. And you just rent these little cabins, some of them very little. Um, there's no electricity, no running water. You have to, you know, go pump water from a well and it's it smells like sulfur and funny minerals and it's like red color <laughs> medicinal it was at one point considered and uh it's a little bit in the forest but there's a little walk you can take i remember I, one of my first long retreats i i spent a month out there and um you could walk to this rock on this hill where there was this view and it had just it was the first snow and there's a sense of looking out over a range and the snow falling and being able to see it falling at a distance, uh, what a relief it felt like for my mind that had been sort of in the, under the canopy of the dark forest for so long. Or a uh, place up in Deerfield, Massachusetts, up, um, Pocomtuck Mountain, maybe? There's a, a walk, I would get up there, just some things were so sort of stressful in my life or felt sort of too consuming at my school. And I would go up and kind of look again at this sort of rock that really had this big view and um, just how important it was to get that sense of space. So I was, I found 
how important it has been throughout my life to be able to to get a physical sense of space and distance and and how calming and kind of relaxing that has been for my mind for my system and you know for my body and um and and also i think there's something about practice that's so important to explore and examine and get to a deeper understanding of space you know you know because what does what you know for me in these times what has it really meant it's has it meant a really a sense of needing more physical space uh to some degree you know it has felt like that um a lack of seclusion you know but 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 how is that actually experienced directly right it's 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 more in terms of the pressures of impingement and interaction and responsibility for, um, you know, what's coming at me in my sense experience. And one thing that we start to see in practice, particularly in the, um, the Burmese Theravadan lineages and the, when you look at the Vasudhi Maga and the Mahasi um, practice, there's such an emphasis on time and experiencing and, and training the mind to attain, a, attune to the momentary nature of experience, right? The anicca, impermanent quality of experience and to, to s- start to be able to, to see life as a string of constantly changing momentary experiences throughout the sense doors. And um, one of the things that we come to see in that is that the sense of space is constructed, right? That that if, whether you're in a desert or whether you're in the middle of a crowded room, the experiential difference is, is um, on, on one level non-existent. They're still just seeing, they're still just hearing, they're still just thinking, they're still just the body, they're still all just the sense doors. The difference is the way in which the mind interprets certain visual experiences as being more distant or closer, interprets interprets sound as being more distant or closer, interprets the sense of sort of reverb in the room, right? And and the the physical and sort of psychic qualities of space, um, we can start to see as actually something that is constructed, that the mind is creating, that is it is weaving out of an interpretation of direct sense experience. And that that's a very important thing to be able to start to do, to start to attune, to, to, to start to observe how the mind is constructing our sense of space and how much of that is um, determined by the conditions of the mind and how much of that is determined by the conditions of, of the, what we're subject to in terms of the, the sensory experience. And so really that when I say like, oh, wanting more space or when we say wanting more space, what does that really mean? A lot of times it does mean sort of more calm or more equanimity, um, more, uh, less pressure, more seclusion, um, less anxiety, right? That actually there's sort of qualities of mind that sometimes can be induced through a, an experience that is three-dimensional around us. But in a very important ways, it's actually qualities of mind that are available and can be cultivated and created under any conditions, right? Um, and that's very important to recognize that ultimately we do have the power to create a sense of space, to abide in a sense of space, to and all the ways that that means, whether that means physical space or peace of mind, ease of mind, equanimity, um, no matter what physical space we're actually in. And of course, there are some that are more conducive to it than others because of our conditioning, right? Because of how, how hard it is to feel spacious in a room full of people that are arguing, for example, right? Um, and yet to remember that it's possible. And so that we have in our 
tradition or our lineage, a few, you know, the two main ways of kind of creating a sense of space are through concentration and through insight. And um, the various forms, the various methods, the various approaches that we have to that. And so the practice that we did today around sort of getting a sense of a limited space, small or large, uh, and filling it with love and kindness, it's not uh, exactly a, a traditional practice, you know, one that we'll find in the Vasudhi Maga, but you'll see ones that are related, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment. But but basically, what part of how that functions is not necessarily creating more space, literally, right? But that through concentration on an abstract experience or notion, right, that we're able to basically suppress the volatility of other sense experiences. We're able to sort of suppress the hindrance response of the mind. And so there is a sense of calm, a sense of concentration, a sense of peacefulness, joy, um, uh, engrossment, right? There are sort of, I'm not saying them in order, but experiences of the mind that, that can, due to concentration, help give us that sense of space, a sense of relief from the pressure of the kind of bombardment of experience we are subject to all the time. And the notion of focusing on space is actually a classic um, practice, you know, something that these, these practices of concentration that really predate the Buddha and his teachings, things that he trained in and understood, and but were also more broadly trained um, in different traditions. Um, in order to really kind of get to experiences of, of very powerful concentration um, and seclusion of the mind that would give the sense of, of this sort of spaciousness and stability and relief from the pressures of um, experience. What the Buddha realized and, and his approach was realizing that these were not satisfactory ultimately, right? That, that you couldn't suppress them forever. You couldn't there was never going to be a, a, an ability to control through concentration the fluctuations of life for for long periods of time uh, or or for infinite period of time that ultimately the energy would dissipate and you would have to let it go and and things would come rushing back and there might be a sense of defenselessness right that 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 ultimately the deeper liberation was through wisdom was through finding peace and st the stability of mind through the non-manipulation and non-construction and non-controlling element that comes through wisdom, through understanding phenomena as impermanent, as uh, subject to uh, decay and undependable, um, unsatisfactory and without essential self. But it didn't mean he just threw away all these other practices. There's still practice in um, this tradition and in others and have been for, you know, uh, millennia. And so you have in, um, like in the Vasudhi Maga, a real detailed, like the path of purification. It's a, a yeah, for folks who aren't familiar, this kind of big tome that's, you know, very, uh, you know, Buddha Gosa, uh, um, in Sri Lanka many hundreds of years ago, kind of compiled all of these accounts from elder monks and nuns um, of the you know generations to sort of come up with this manual of, of instruction and insight into this path. And so you'll find these, what are called the casinas, objects of meditation for the development of concentration. And you, you know, there's a, elemental ones of earth, uh, water, fire, and air. There's color casinas of blue, yellow, red, white. Then there's light, and then there's space, limited space as a casino. And so you basically, you have these practices that are, of course, very esoteric, ultimately, um, where you focus on like a small area where you have a blue circle, you know, or you put dirt there and, or, uh, 
you know, what have you, and you focus on this, focus on this, concentrate on this, and you, you really sort of seclude yourself in a very powerful way where you're just concentrating on earth, 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 or, or space, right? This idea that um, you can do it sort of as we did in the sort of sense of the space of a room, uh, the space of a window, space of a keyhole, um, are sort of some of the classic suggestions. Or you can cut out a circle and a kind of, uh, I say, you know, piece of leather, a piece of cloth, and you're focusing on this space, this, this delineated space. Um, and so with all of these, the idea is you, you concentrate on it, concentrate on it, you know, day and night. And um, at some point, the concentration becomes stable enough that, that you actually don't need the visual form there, that the mind sort of creates a stable notion of this earth or fire or air or space or light or white or blue or whatever. And, um, and then you can start just concentrating on that. And then at some point that changes and Anyway, the point is, is you get into um, very powerful, um, very stable degrees of kind of concentrated absorption. And um, and you know, in, in the text, they're very, they're very kind of like matter of fact about the the like if you if you want to develop certain like superhuman powers that you would do so through these practices. Right. Um, and so the sense of space is, is uh, an interesting one because it's like you, you, you do see that even in this short practice we did that, that there is some ability to kind of get a sense of space of the sense, you know, of space. Now, the, the inclusion of loving kindness into that is not part of the traditional, right? That's considered like a, a different practice, one that you actually don't need to extend the, the Brahma Viharas. Uh, and it's interesting because with the Brahma Viharas, the loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, the idea is that you're, the extension is really about inclusivity, um, not necessarily about expanding through space uh, or um, uh, increasing numbers of people that are included, but it's the inclusiveness around the preferred or unpreferred beings <laughs> uh, in our in our in our heart. And um, but nevertheless, of course, there are practices where you're doing it in this north direction or in this east, west, south, and um, you know there are many many ways of doing it. But the and we're never going to teach these as like primary things that are, you know, when you come on retreat and um, it, they're, they're not necessary. You, the, the degree of concentration you'd need to get to be able to like do these superhuman things. It's like, it's very rare, right? It's like, of course, even in Burma, um, you know, they say there are people still doing it and who can and do these things. But most of the stories are from older generations, you know, of monks and nuns who um, had a, uh, had practiced these things. But Sayyidah Ulakana, often at the end of the Chazo retreat, would always sort of do a similar kind of formula of appreciating other traditions and, and would talk about Jesus and, you know, what a wonderful teacher he was and um, how he obviously had practiced so much metta and loving kindness, um, but also that clearly he had practiced earth kasina um, because that's, that is how one would, if you wanted to walk on water, that's how you would do it, right? You would you would focus on earth, 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 to the degree that which like you get it in your head and then you extend it, and so that every direction, right? Every everything you experience, you, the mind sort of is able to kind of like not just sort of suppress the the dynamics of physical reality, but really kind of super override them so that you, everything you're, you, wh wherever you want to relate to as earth becomes earth, right? And so that the water has that sense of firmness um, that one would walk on top of it. And so the, the space casino really, you know, it's, it's like if you, if you ever were imprisoned or if you find yourself under a pile of rubble, um, there would be some value in in learning to to deepen your concentrative capacity with it because it is through space 
and the focus on space that one is able to, so it is said, um, walk through walls and uh, or find a place to sit inside a big boulder. So that if you're near a boulder, you can you could kind of like let there be space there and you, you manifest sort of space inside um, something very firm. Uh, so you could kind of go, you know, you could find some seclusion no matter where you were, you know. I, there was a funny thing. If you ever, if anyone ever gets there, decides to spend the time on it, you might want to know this. One who wants to go in this way should attain the space casino and emerge and then do the preliminary work by adverting to the wall or the enclosure or some such mountain or the world's fear mountains and they should resolve let there be space it becomes space only it becomes hollow for him if he wants to go down or up it becomes cleft for him if he wants to penetrate it he goes through it unhindered here is the text he is normally an obtainer of the space casino attainment he adverts through the wall through the enclosure through the mountain having adverted he resolves with knowledge let there be space and there is space he goes unhindered through the wall through the enclosure through the mountain just as people normally not possessed of supernormal power go unhindered where there is no obstruction or enclosure so too this possessor of the supernormal power by his attaining mental mastery goes unhindered through the wall through the enclosure through the mountain as through an open space. But what if a mountain or tree is raised in this bhikkhu's way while they are traveling along, resolving? Should they attain the resolve again? There is no harm in that. For attaining and resolving again is like taking the dependence in the preceptor's presence. And because the bhikkhu has resolved, let there be space, there will be open, only space there. And because of the power of this first resolve, it is impossible that another mountain or tree can have sprung up meanwhile by temperature. However, if this mountain or tree has been created by another possessor of supernormal power and created first, it prevails and the former must go above or below it. So if you have the ability to penetrate through mountains and trees, but someone else has thrown a mountain or tree in your way, you have to do it again before you can go through that mountain or tree that they've thrown in your way, just in case you ever come upon that situation in your practice. Which we don't teach. But it's fun to look at, you know, I mean, it is, it's like, you know, who knows? Uh, but you do get the sense, right, that the mind is not only bound by the body, that there are experiences that we have that are so different than our normal everyday experience of mind and body, of who we are, of the relationship with the world around us or with the world internally, um, that it is it is fun and, and important, actually, to, to read these things, to study them to some degree. Um, and, and, I, and, you know, we would never say that it's important to practice them because the amount of time that it takes to get to any degree of concentration like that, and it's not just you have to get to that degree of concentration, but you actually are supposed to then be able to kind of weave in and out through between all of the different material and immaterial jhanas of absorption and you know it's just at, at this point um maybe several thousand years ago where people were you know really just full-time renunciates for their whole lives and they had all this time to practice and all these supportive conditions for it that there was a a, a, a value to that um but at this point you know we, we really come from a lineage that that feels like it's um for the most part and for most of us there is um such precious little time that we actually devote to our meditation practice and that this can be you know such a powerful um misguided um 
path to go on um, because it doesn't necessarily lead to understanding or wisdom or insight or the deeper ability to liberate the heart and mind from suffering. And so, you know, this, and yet there, there is a, a value to it. And I, and I think part of it, and I said this uh, to, to some degree in the, um, the retreat last Saturday, that was helpful to me, you know, during my, my time traveling where I wasn't able to maybe seclude as much as I'd like or as much as I'm used to and where I was in spaces and with people um, in ways that were, um, not always easy for me to always sort of find my my way back to um you know the deepest aspirations of the heart um this notion of when in a room right um whether it's stressful or not right and there's people and there's activity happening is there a way what is it to to attune to the space right to the sense of space uh, of the room we're in, or the sense of the building that we're in, and and how that actually can be a very powerful anchor outside of the fluctuations of the reality of experience that's happening in the moment. So there are ways that we use these tools of concentration, these tools of, of mental fabrication, in order to find some wholesome way of stabilizing the attention to not be swept downstream to not get too overrun um, or caught in our you know habitual tendencies what is it to get a sense of the space does that provide any of what we're looking for perhaps in terms of spaciousness right this just like gentle attuning to the space of this room right or the space of the building or the space right around me and then what might it be like to fill that with loving kindness, right? And again, not just in terms of a formal meditation practice that we're doing in our kind of preferred way, but in the times where we're less in control of the conditions we're in, where we're with other people, we're in a classroom, we're in an office, we're in wherever, family situation. What is it like to get a sense of the space and then fill the space with tenderness of heart? And it doesn't have to feel like, oh, you're picking this person who's difficult or picking this person who's easy. Or it's like you're filling the space with care. And there's something of that kind of level of abstraction sometimes that's actually more accessible than finding care for a specific being, a specific person. Um, and to consider that, right? Consider that as a tool that can be very helpful. And all of these tools can be helpful, right? To understand the value and the power of concentration to anchor us when we need to, and that it can be an anchor in something that we're conjuring, um, that that's very powerful. And it's actually important to, to some one degree or another to have a sense of confidence in the mind's ability to do that. And then there is the, of course, just the deeper truth of experience and of liberation, which is to say the non-conjured, uh, the non-manipulated, and the momentary experience of reality of this constantly changing flux of sensations of mind and body, mind and matter, um, of all the sense doors. And that, again, our, of our deeper training, our more profound training is the space that is not necessarily dimensional, but that is in the mind. And mind as a momentary experience has the ability to feel equanimity with whatever formations that are arising, right? Pleasant, painful, or neutral. You know, there's no, sometimes we want the sense of space through controlling conditions through, and, and, and of course, we're not just trying to say that we you know, throw our lives to the wind and, and don't try to manage the 
the intensity of what we're up against and, and where the capacity of the mind is in any given moment or throughout our lives. But we also know that we can't manage that perfectly. We cannot control it perfectly. And so this, the deepening practice of one moment to the next and the, the uncontrollable, undependable, um, painful nature of, of phenomena, right? And so sometimes we say, oh, we want space or like, oh, that really that's sort of meaning we really want more pleasant experience over a longer period of time. And of course that's fine. It's understandable, but to see that like even a bombardment of pleasant experience over time, when we get to the subtleties of it, it's still suffering, right? It's still dukkha when we start to watch it as it's arising and passing as it's un instability is so apparent when we observe pleasant experience. Right? Or we try to get in between moments of experience, thinking that, oh, maybe there's a space in between moments that is liberatory, that is relief. But we start to see that there is no space between moments, that, that whether it's a moment of physicality, then there's a moment of mentality. We might have relief from one experience of, of dukkha, of hardship in the body, but even that moment of relief then is a mental experience. That's another moment. Right, so that this the the relentlessness and the persistence of experience in mind and body is um, a kind of suffering that we have to show up for. We have to at some point also recognize and acknowledge and and be humbled by, and see that it's the mind is actually it's the doorway. It, that suffering is the doorway of liberation because it's like we. It's the, the, that place of just surrender to the fact of this flood of fabrications, this flood of phenomena that is out of our control, but that the mind does have the ability to actually be at peace with all of them, with all formations, regardless of how fast they're coming, how pleasant they are, how unpleasant they are, at which sense door they're coming in but that it only happens through the practice that we do, which is right primarily the, the observation of experience and the coming to know experience in, in its deepest and most subtle and most gross and all of the spectrum of, of its arising. To know every potential experience in the body, to know all the potential experiences in the mind uh, and the heart, the, the realms of joy and sorrow, of hope and despair, of, of all of it, the sense of at some point the mind stops recoiling, right? But also stops trying to manipulate, stops trying to control, doesn't need to. It sees the pain in that. It sees the pain and the preference. It sees the pain and the wanting or the not wanting and is um, dis finds that distasteful and lets go. And in this letting go, there is this ultimately um, un, um, full unhooking that can happen, right? This liberation of mind that happens in small ways, but can happen in bigger ways. And it can happen over time in ways that are irreversible. Right, that the that the mind stops being fueled by wanting or not wanting, that the addiction to certain experiences, the dependency, the sense of dependency on the satisfaction through any sense experience, is overcome, um, because the mind is so strong and so confident and so humble and so tender um, with whatever experience that it's arising. Um, that it allows whatever phenomena to arise and pass on its own. So just remembering that these are, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of room for all the tools that we may have um, for concentration, for backing off, for moving in, um, things that we may develop on our own, uh, things that come from this, these texts, things that come from other traditions, but always to understand like where where do they fall where where do we place them in the broader context of insight and, and liberatory insight that we're so rooted in and as a, that is the fundamental gift of this tradition this lineage and these teachings 
right? To, to see that it's like, oh, it doesn't have to be exclusive in terms of what we might bring in to support our mind, to support our concentration, to support our sense of faith along the way. Um, but to also not confuse the tools um, and not misunderstand the different methods and approaches with the ultimate um, mechanics of insight, which are, you know, fueled primarily by mindfulness, um, along with, of course, all the other factors and things that we talk about. But this non-manipulative observational capacity of the mind um, that that understands and grows in understanding, and how unique and powerful and essential that is, um, is just yeah really important to not lose sight of when we do try other tools and other tactics and other ways of practicing. I think that'll be it for today. Um, Hope it was helpful to one degree or another. And we do have time. Um, if anyone has questions about uh, your practice, about uh, this practice that we did today, uh, about some of the other practices you may have spoken of, um, or about the talk. Jane, is that, do you have a question there? Yeah, oh, we can. Yes, I have a question. Is, is Vipassana meditation and insight meditation the same? Or do they use different tools? I... Yeah, I mean, insight is usually one of the, a way of translating the word Vipassana. I mean, people break down that word Vipassana in different ways uh, etymologically, but but yes. So, so insight meditation is Vipassana. We're in a little bit of a time where some of these things are blurred a little bit in terms of like the West and like mindfulness and insight traditions and Theravada and Buddhism and um, kind of where they sort of fit together might not always be clear or not always coherent across the sort of field, but yes, yeah, it is. But is there another, is there any more sort of a question there in terms of like things that felt like maybe not coherent or not? Um, the same? No, I was just thinking about all the different kinds of meditation out there, and I didn't know if these were the same because I am in a mindful uh, meditation group through o our Oregon State University and then through this in a Vipassana, and I didn't, my experience is there's a lot of things that overlap, but I wasn't sure what the difference really is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's there's gonna it's always sort of case by case, right? In terms of and also what lineage people are coming out of, and is it a kind of uh, traditional lineage, or is it more of a like mindfulness based stress reduction lineage, or a what's the word they use? N non non something mindfulness. <laughs> anyway, like so, I think. Um, and then even within just Burma, right? There's like so many really different lineages and different methods that are emphasized or practices that are emphasized. And then you go to Thailand and there's gonna be still part of what's considered, you know, the Theravadan world, but a lot less emphasis on some of the commentarial stuff like the Vasudhi Maga and um, sometimes a, a really different way of talking about um, space and time and uh, certain experiences. So there's going to be a huge range, you know, I think no matter what, not just in the West and not just in sort of modern times. Um, but I think I will say too that like what so much of what is generally taught in what I would say is what I am more familiar with in terms of like Western, which I would say like United States, Canada, and 
Europe, the, the, my understanding in terms of even Vipassana really tends to be very focused on um, like the sort of primary practices and methods of observing the breath or observe the four foundations of mindfulness, observing these, these things, right? The, um, the body, feeling tone, mind and everything else, right? So like these sort of structures of where to bring enough concentration and enough mindfulness to observe the direct experience. And so there is a way in which those are, and the many methods that are associated with that are the sort of like primary um, vehicles for insight to happen, right? Classical insight to happen and mostly come from really just sort of two suttas or a few suttas in the, in the canon. The truth is, of course, in the traditions, there are many other practices. And, you know, we, if, you know, you come to, we try to talk about some of the different ones, you know, uh, reflections on death or reflections on the virtues of the Buddha or loving kindness and all the Brahma Viharas. And so there's like sort of layers of more common or more esoteric practices that are, that are still part of the tradition that may not be sort of emphasized as much. Um, so there was a funny thing here. Hold on, I want to actually. Oh, I don't know if it's in that same. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this elder Tipitaka Chula Abaya, a monk, it says, friends, what is the use of attaining the space casino, Jhana? Does one who wants to create elephants, horses, etc., attain elephant casino, Jhana, or horse casino, Jhana? I always thought of it like you could you do like pizza casino, you know, if you want to just manifest pizza everywhere. Uh, surely the only standard is mastery in the eight attainments. And after the preliminary work has been done in any casino, it then becomes whatever he wishes. Um, Venerable sir, only the space casino has been given in the text, so it should certainly be mentioned. <laughs> anyway, the idea is like, you know, they're talking about these sort of classical ones, but yet yeah, conceivably, right, you can what any conceptual thing can be focused on for concentration and um and and people probably have right and so there's probably methods around there for all kinds of things so i don't know if that helps but it's yes that, it's that, just that. to say that like it is all part of the same kind of like thrust of things but it's like a little murky right now but it's also murky in the past <laughs> like there's just there's so much in terms of like what is really creating a sense of coherence and cohesion across so much variety right now, but also across time is sort of like where people identify and 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 the ways we describe it and the where there's a sense of kind of explicit, you know, allegiance to things. Yeah. And so the the practice we did tonight with the space, mm -hmm. how does energy and space come together in terms of concepts in Vipassana? Usually, in my understanding and my reading and my practice, is like the notion of energy is not in terms of a sort of abstract power that asserts itself over space outside of the body, but rather the experience of energy around our actions, right? So, virya. Um, and the way in, in which we might say this sort of like, oh, I felt a lot of energy, right? Or it feels like there's, um, you know, we're sending energy or receiving energy or whatever. A lot of times in terms of Vipassana practice formally, the invitation is to break that down into less of a constructed conceptual overlay and just to talk about the direct experience of like, oh, well, in the body, it felt like rippling. It felt like vibration. It felt intense. It felt like it dissipated. Um, so there's, you're, there's, with all of these things, we're very careful to, to observe the places in which we're interpreting experiences in a way that means something to us, that we're sort of solidifying a, a view of the world based on our direct experience of like, oh, we're receiving energy or we're sending energy. It's like, okay, f the idea really is just like, what's the direct experience? Okay, there's tingling, there's vibration, there's pulsing, there's uh, 
uh, trembling, whatever, right? So, so we break it, we kind of take it out of the notion of energy. Um, I think there is a, like was said in the thing about love and kindness practice, mm -hmm. a carefulness around believing that you are sending love out there right? That the practice is like one in which you're actually like, these people are actually receiving your love and kindness. Now, it's not to say that, that there aren't places where that is, um, that that level of reality might be open to a possible interpretation of what happens. But to understand that technically, the, va the what we're doing is expanding the and, and over getting over any constraints for our heart's ability to love, right? To, that we're increasing the inclusivity of our own heart's ability to care. And that that is the only dependable result of practicing loving kindness, that we're not necessarily gonna be able to heal somebody or fix a relationship or whatever, right? That this idea is actually the, the, the predictable and most important value is expanding our own heart mind's ability to love without distinction. And so that it's always really ultimately going to be about deepening the inclusive capacity of the heart to love versus the sense that you're actually um, doing something active that's actually manipulating anything real in the world around us, right? It isn't to say that it is impossible uh, or that there aren't experiences where things like that are, are um uh, spoken of, right? Or that we might have some experience of that. And so again, with this notion of filling a space with love, just to be careful about where we, where on that line we go. And it's exactly the, the danger of concentration and the danger of these practices is, is basically starting to feel like, oh, I am filling the space with love. I am filling this house with love. I am blah, 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 right? Like I am the vehicle for love. And like, that is like, wah, 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 wah. like that's like a, the, the, the not where this practice is supposed to go. But there is this sense of like, oh, what does it feel like to fill the sort of sense of the space around us with this tenderness? Or what is it like to feel, you know, tenderness towards one person or, or what have you? But it is exactly why there is this carefulness of like always doing whatever kind of more manipulative or concentrative practices we're doing to always purify it through the mindfulness practice of seeing where there's attachment, where there's identification happening and things that will we can use the practice to actually undermine our goal of liberating the heart, you know. Thank you so yeah, much. Great. That's helpful. Cool. Jennifer. Hey. Hey. Um, so I have um, a question about my practice. Mm -hmm. I've been noticing kind of two competing tendencies around mindfulness of thinking. I've been re-listening to Joseph Goldstein's 44 talks on the Satipatthana and I'm in the beginning and um, have sort of, you know, the one of, yeah, one of the four foundations is mindfulness of thinking. And I have like, I don't have, um, I would say in my practice, there's a fair, uh, there's a fair bit of awareness, even though there's not a lot of concentration or con continuity. And what I'm noticing is um, like two competing things. Like one is um, I am starting to get kind of bored and annoyed with my thoughts and just like how relentless they are. And it's there, it's like the same material over and over and again. Again, and and uh, like sometimes there's this feeling. It's just like, I mean, it's a desire. It's just like, oh, could I just not have an effing break for a minute? You know. Um, but then like in the sitting today, it, it was a, like, it was a nice sitting. I was liking, you know, it was interesting to kind of explore the space. It was a new thing. And I could just feel my, um, attention get hooked into thoughts. And like the content was like, I could see that, that the Vedana was pleasant to pay attention to thoughts. Like I could see that I, my, something about whatever, I like wanted to pay attention to the thoughts, even though like the content was about boring home ownership projects. Like it's like 
planning mind. It's like so boring, but I was just, I just <laughs> like, it was pleasant. So I don't know, I don't have any, I don't really have a question. I just have, I'm just noticing these tendencies. And I guess I do have this other sense in my practice. Like I try very hard uh, to just show up and not uh, like have milestones or goals or achievement mindset. Like I just try and show up. And as I also do that, I like, it kind of feels like I've been just kind of for, for like a couple of years, even just kind of in a similar spot. Um, anyway, so I, I would just curious to know if you have any reflections on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really, it's, it's so great. and It's so important. And I, uh, I just, you know, it's like the kind of thing that I, I, we hope that people like relish that even as horrible, <laughs> as horrible as it is, like the, to see, we have to get so tired of the mind and, and um, frustrated by it and, <sighs> you know, feel kind of berated by it and, and wishing it would stop. And, and, and there's something of that, like desperation of just like wanting it to stop. That is so impor important, you know, to get to, to have, to experience, to really see the oppressiveness of even like really mundane thoughts, right? Like, I think it's such a good example, especially the last part of, of, of thoughts that are, it's not even, they're not even volatile. It's not even super greedy or super anger or whatever. It's just boring thoughts um, that still just won't stop. And, and the momentum of them um, is, yeah very intense and so i you know really it's like yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for you because it's it is so important and it's um you have to go through that you have to with all of this it's not just thoughts it's like the the times where we it's like we have to really see how much we want to be free and how painful it is that we're not but then the of course there's that dance of not wanting to kind of spiral into despair or hopelessness or feeling like there's no way to do it. Um, and especially in the context of what you're saying, where like these periods can last a while. There's a little bit of a sense sort of like of a, um, you hit the so-called quote unquote same material over and over um, is, you know, the sort of classic refrain of where like people are like, oh, maybe I should, you know, go to Tibetan stuff or, uh, you know, the ayahuasca or whatever, right? Because it's just like, you just need to like crank it up somehow because it's just like, and to go through the doldrums and to go through the sort of relentlessness of it in the desert of the mind and the, the, the boredom with our own mind um, is so important. And, and so to not lose, I mean, you know, whatever we're going to try it. It's like, we, we, we do what we do. And the sense of, it's like the wanting of things to be one way or then the other is <laughs> just the basic dukkha, right? It's like wanting that which is not capable of stability to be stable, right? Wanting, uh, wanting things to be the way we want them to be, whether it's in the mind or the body or the world or whatever, is just, you know, this sort of quintessential aspect of it. So uh, I think since you're already kind of looking at the uh, practices of around chitta nupassana and observation of the mind i think it's just worth really doing in a more even a more wholehearted way right where it's like what is it like to perhaps when you're sitting it's like oh you get a little quiet doing whatever whether it's your you know anchoring on body or breath loving kindness whatever right you you spend some time sort of getting quiet and this will be different for everyone but just sort of when you feel like you get quiet and you're a little bit a little bit settled what is it and what is the experience and the practice like to just turn the attention to the mind right to to not feel like it's the problem and that it's the um 
the thing we just wish would stop or whatever, even if we do just wish it would stop, can we find any interest in it, right? Can we bring the same qualities to bear on the mind as we do to the breath or the body or sound, which is like, okay, we have our preferences, but we're also just interested in it. We're interested in it for its own nature, understanding its mechanics. What is driving these these thoughts? What is really happening there? what when we listen closer when we look more closely is it really what we think it is you know because i think often what we'll find is the the mental the material that's being produced by the mind the content is actually way more diverse and bizarre and wild than the kind of things that tend to get locked in the loops right um and part of that is you start to see why the mind is picking certain things to keep hooking into uh, because they're familiar, because it makes us feel like us. There's a stability that it's it's trying to kind of keep reasserting on life and on experience um, or fear or whatever, right? So it's like this sense of sort of interest. But if you can start to watch the mind in an easeful way, um, in a way that's dedicated, you'll start to see that there's all kinds of other nonsense, like way more incoherent you know, like gobbledygook that's being like spewed out all the time that we might actually kind of not be that sensitive to because it's not the thing that we're tending to kind of focus on that the mind is sort of amidst all that's being produced in the mind. It's just like it would in seeing. It's like, are you going to tend to notice the things that are familiar or a danger or something you want or whatever the many reasons we may sort of like pick certain things out of the field of vision and prioritize them? or in sensory experience, oh, the more painful things are going to get more attention than the neutral places. Something similar happening in the mind. And so it's important to be able to start to get a sense of the the whole spectrum of mental experience. So thought, but also emotion, but also just knowing, right? So that there's, there's other, there's all, aspects of the mind that are not just thought, right? That are knowing, that are emotion, that are um, uh, views, that are getting conjured and kind of recreated all the time. And so a lot of it is just starting to get a sense of like, okay, what are all the flavors of it? What's the spectrum of experience we call mind or heart? And um, and it's hard. It's harder to do than with the body. I and mean, the body is so hard in and of itself, but the mind, because it's not tangible and is happening so quickly and also not actually in a discrete space the, the my, like our mental experience is actually not a spatial experience in the same way we interpret our physical experience to be it's just harder to keep on it and to really observe it so you just have to be ready for the fact that you're gonna get lost in thought and you're gonna be wandering more and kind of lose track of observing the mind and just being sort of involved in it but if you're willing to do that and not worried about like getting lost in the same thought 150 Fifty thousand time pattern and it's like oh, okay okay what happened where where did the mind where did we lose it and genuine interest instead of chastisement um where it's like okay you you start to see the field of mental and emotional experience just as you do the body or other senses um i would say that it's like a great time given what you're saying about what's happening in the rest of your practice to let the dynamism of that maybe kind of be a, a place that you allow for more exploration and don't worry about your breath or whatever you're using as a kind of primary primary anchor or however you're tending to practice right now. Um, see what it's like to just give a little more space to just trying to observe the mind and with as much sort of stability and patience and tenderness and also kind of subtlety as you can. Um, I don't know, how does that sound? Yeah, great, I like that idea. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, and just, you know, don't lose sight of that wanting and the and of wanting it to stop, wanting it to go away, like the the boredom of it, the you know, it's like it's the it's the acceptance and the the seeing of wanting, the acceptance of wanting, the ability to feel it rather than and to to really understand the wanting and to feel the wanting rather than being so focused on the object of the wanting coming, going away or being different or whatever. It's like, that's the ticket always, whether it's in the mind related to the mind or related to another experience in the body or senses. It's just like, it's the knowing of the wanting 
the and the pulling back from the projection of the object of the wanting or the not wanting and feeling the pain here um it's just it's so important and, and I, I guess what i want to say too like because it related to my talk where there is this one hand where yes we're trying to you know we're, we're open to knowing all of what can happen in the physical experience. We can know all that happens in the heart and mind experience. And, and the beauty of that, of like knowing what it is to be a being and that you see someone else's anguish and you don't distinguish that from your own. There isn't this sort of separation, right? Or, or if you're not afraid of your own fear, you're not afraid of someone else's fear. Or if you're not afraid of your own anger, you're actually not going to be afraid of someone else's anger. That there's this sense of like, the more we get to know the vast spectrum of humanity and of being through our direct experience, the more universal that is. And the more actually there is a, a sense of non-separation, um, and insight happens with one thing. It doesn't, you actually, like, the other side of it is we don't necessarily need to know the full spectrum of every single aspect of human experience. It's like, actually, you can get liberated just watching the breath, right? Like, total, full enlightenment can happen just, like, taking a step and, and being totally attuned to the dynamics of one physical gesture. So to also just be careful too about like the grandiosity of what's possible and where the practice does develop our ability to be with all things and all possible aspects of the universe in this fathom long body. And it's like insight can happen at any moment when the conditions are there. And a lot of what we're doing is just sort of like attuning to what the conditions are and developing the mind's ability to have more natural response of appropriate and powerful conditions, no matter what is happening, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, Quinn. Yeah, um, can you unmute there? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. So um, your your talk about the casino is intriguing and entertaining, but um, I think closer to my uh, reality is is the uh, the experience with the Zen tea ceremony, where you have like six or eight people in a very small room. And everybody is quiet, and uh, so so you, you got your tea, and you hold the cup, and you look at the tea, and you appreciate the aroma, and you have a sip, and everybody is into her own experience, and and you you you're in a very small room, you observe other people's space. And even though it's very cramped, it feels so uh, spacious and limitless. So I think it, it probably what you're talking about is like, it's all in the mind, right? That's so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. It's like when you're concentrated and, and mindful that like things feel spacious. I mean, like you say, it's like, it doesn't have to be that much more complicated, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's so beautiful and it's so pure. And, and um, yeah. what I love about that example too, is like, it's also, it's a ceremonializing of something very normal, mundane right. drinking yeah. tea, you yeah. know, that's the Japanese. Right. Yeah. Really beautiful. Yeah. And I do think where, you know, where and that's of course such a big part of the zen is like what form is emptiness emptiness is form where where do we ritualize these things and where do we not need the ritual in order to have this quality of experience, relationship right, to whatever right. whatever we're doing and, you and know? we just have that experience at any moment right it doesn't have to be just a tea ceremony right? yeah. yeah may it be so yeah <laughs> thank you mm, thank you Hmm. 
well, maybe we'll call it a day for today. And um, yeah, just hope everyone takes care. Next Sunday will be Halloween. So spend all, you know, and of course all the Day of the Dead and All Saints Day and All Hallows Eve. It's like, it's a powerful time no matter where we are, right, of the seasons shifting. And um, yeah, maybe start to spend some time thinking about all of the the unseen beings that are around us and wandering around and happy or unhappy, um, the ones who've gone before us and uh, where we are in our lives and the, the cycle of uh, existence. I think it's a very powerful time for all those reflections. So may be good in, in preparation for next Sunday. I can't remember when their retreat ends. So I don't we don't know who will be here next week. One question I do have, does anyone when does the time change? Does anyone know? November seventh. Okay. Okay, great. So that's in a couple of weeks. Uh, just as a reminder, Hawaii doesn't change time. Uh, twice a year. So come November 7th, everyone on the mainland will, and elsewhere that changes, it'll just be, it'll start to be an hour earlier. Right? Yeah. Uh, and we will stay the same. But uh, we'll send a, we'll send an email reminder about that, but just sort of keep it in the, in the back of your heads. Yeah. All right, everybody, really wonderful to be with you all and take good care. Thank See you, you next Jesse. week. Yeah. Aloha. Bye.